Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, let's just begin uh, the class with the word of prayer. Someone could pray for us, please. Okay, I'll pray for us. Father, we uh, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather together to learn from your word. Uh, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to uh, teach us, to open our eyes, um, our ears, our hearts to what you want to uh, reveal to us, Lord. Uh, we pray that as we look at your word, Lord, uh, that it would be a time of revelation and a time of just growing in you, in knowing you, and in loving you, Lord, um, that what we learn here will not um, not only reach our minds, but also reach our hearts, Lord, and uh, Lord, that we would learn to love you more through what we learn. Uh, we commit this time into your hands and commit all of the other classes, um, our students, our staff, our faculty into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so today we're just going to be looking at uh, first and second Peter. Um, I'm just going to share a screen. So um, the two letters written by the Apostle Peter. And um, yeah, I think we should be able to cover the two in today's class. So uh, just a little bit of background. Um, the first the first letter uh, written by peter addresses persecuted believers okay uh, and uh, this is both to jews and gentiles in asia minor um, so if we read 1 peter 1:1 1, 1, if someone can just open that up and read that for us please peter an apostle of jesus christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, so uh, if you look on the map here, that's basically this area in Asia Minor. Um, that's Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Bithynia, so uh, provinces in Asia, Roman prom provinces in Asia Minor. And um, there are three possible instances for when this letter was written, because we know that's written to persecuted believers. Um, so it's either under Nero, which was, uh, he was there around AD 60 to 64, or under Domitian, but that was later around AD 90 when uh, Revelation is written, um, or in the second century. But uh, we believe that this letter is in fact written by the Apostle Peter, as it states here in uh, 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And so uh, the date that we uh, look at is AD 63-64. Um, this is when Nero uh, kind of starts his persecution, AD 64 is when uh, he begins to uh, more intensely persecute Christians, accusing them of having burnt the city um, down. And so it's during this time that he murders uh, thousands of Christians in Rome. There are a lot of them who end up escaping his persecution, uh, but he caused a lot of suffering for Christians. So he was seen almost as um, an example or uh, someone who resembled the Antichrist uh, because of how much suffering he caused uh, to the Christians. Um, so he finally, Nero died uh, several years later, and he was killed by Romans uh, themselves. He was, although he was loved by Greeks, he was uh, not loved by many Romans, and so he was uh, killed by some Romans later on um, after this persecution. Uh, we see also that Paul, towards the end of the letter, sends greetings from the church in Babylon. 
Um, and so it indicates that Paul was in Rome and Babylon is used as code for Rome, like we see in Revelation as well. Um, the purpose of writing a book to encourage believers who were suffering uh, so in the midst of their suffering, he's writing to them to encourage them uh, to continue firm in the faith, um, to teach believers uh, to be patient even in their present circumstances, and to prepare them for the suffering that would come. Uh, so since Paul was in, uh, since Peter was in Rome, he was experiencing much more uh, of the persecution than the believers in Asia Minor. But he was writing to prepare them that this is possibly what you are going to experience as well. So he's sharing from his, uh, his experience to prepare them. The theme uh, is comfort for suffering Christians. We see suffering mentioned 17 times uh, in this book in First Peter. And uh, let's just read these key verses. Uh, First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 12 and 13. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Verse 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. OK, so um, these verses actually bring up a lot of what Peter talks about in this letter. Uh, one is suffering, but suffering as Christ suffered. So uh, he keeps taking them back to Christ's suffering. In your suffering, you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And then the other aspect of it is we are suffering only in this world. We have this future glory to look forward to. And so that's his encouragement to them that uh, even though we are suffering, uh, look, there is something to look forward to, and that is the eternal glory that will be ours in Christ. So I haven't uh, covered some of the other parts uh, that are mentioned in your textbook. Uh, there are uh, a few other things, um, but I just want to make one correction to your notes in your textbook. Um, there are seven uh, precious things in First Peter that's mentioned. Uh, in your textbook. The first two of those precious things is actually from Second Peter. OK, so just make that correction in your textbooks. Um, we are not going to cover it here in class. But in your textbooks, um, the, from those seven precious things, the first two are from Second Peter. The reference is given there, I think, is 1.1 one, one and 1.4. One, is that right? One one and one four, I think. So that's Second Peter one one and Second Peter one four. I don't have it open here. Um, is that what you're seeing in your textbook, Asapun? Uh, yeah, the seven precious things. The first two references, one one and one four, right? So that's Second Peter one one and Second Peter one four. Okay. Uh, so I'm skipping over some of those things that I felt we didn't need to cover in class. Um, we'll go into an outline of First Peter. Um, so uh, First Peter begins with suffering in relation to salvation. Um, and we have that greeting that we read just now from Peter to these churches in Asia Minor. Uh, then he talks about our suffering for a little while uh, so that we can rejoice in an eternal salvation. And if we look at verses 3 to 25 of chapter 1, you'll see Peter constantly mentioning the words perishable and imperishable. Okay, so he's saying, he's comparing all these things that we are experiencing on earth as perishable and 
the glory that is to come, the eternal glory that is to come as something that is imperishable. Uh, he mentions that a few times in these few verses. Uh, from there, he goes on to talk about holiness. Uh, so there's a call to holiness in verses 13 to 21, saying in view of the fact that this is just a temporal life that we're living and we have this eternal future to look ahead to, put away all kinds of sin. So live your life uh, in view of that eternal glory and uh, take away anything that is in not in line with godliness. Take that away from your life. Uh, the second is the call to love, verses 22 to 25. So not only turn away from sin, but also uh, love one another. That is uh, his call. And then the third is a call to growth. So he talks about personal spiritual growth, growing from being babies to being mature in the faith, and also growing as the body of Christ, growing into this spiritual temple, that is built on the cornerstone of Christ himself. Um, then uh, he, in chapters 2, verses 11 to 12, he talks about our conduct as strangers and pilgrims. And this is from the perspective of we are here to be witnesses to the people around us. So as the church, uh, the way we live should testify to who Christ is when other people are watching us. Uh, and then he goes on to state specific examples of how we can do that. Uh, verses 13 to 17 is, as citizens, we submit to authority. So uh, just for us to consider this, there are people who are being persecuted by the government, right? But in that, he's still encouraging them submit to authority. He's not saying just because the government is against you, you can also be against the government. He doesn't say that, right? He still says we will submit to authority because they are the people who have been put in charge by God. And if they punish us for doing evil, there is nothing that will testify uh, about who we are. But if we are punished for doing good, that will be a testimony to people. OK, so uh, he continues that same line of thought uh, with slaves and masters as well. So even if you are being mistreated by your master, you continue to do what's right. Um, and then he mentions the example of Christ. So let's just read that. Uh, chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. First Peter, chapter 2, verse 23. Who, when he was revealed, did not reveal in return. When he suffered, he did not uh, threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. OK, so he's saying, follow the example of Christ. Though he was being insulted, though he was being mistreated, and he had all the power to retaliate, he chose to entrust himself to God. In the same way, in your present suffering, trust yourselves to God that God will judge. God will bring justice. Um, but you do what is right. So you live righteously, and that will be your witness. Um, he then goes on to talk about wives and husbands um, in chapter 3. And then uh, later on in chapter 3, about people who suffer innocently. We'll just read chapter 3, verses 17, if someone can read that for us. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. OK, so that's the main line of thought in all of these examples that he's giving. So even if you are being unjustly treated, you're suffering, although you have done nothing wrong, uh, it's better that you continue to do what is right than that you do evil and then start to suffer for doing evil. So he he's saying continue to live righteously, continue to live in holiness. And if you are to suffer, it's all right. 
because it's better to suffer for doing good rather than to suffer for doing evil. Uh, he then goes on into chapter four, uh, contrasting our new life in Christ with us as old uh, believers or no, unbelievers under the yoke of sin. So he says, put away sin and live for God. Uh, then chapter 4, 12 to 19, again goes back to suffering with Christ. Um, let's just read two verses from chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1 and chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 14th verse, sister. Uh, 13, chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Okay, so in this first part, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, he's talking about suffering in relation to holiness. So uh, it's okay to suffer in the body because when you're suffering in the body, you are putting away all sinfulness. Uh, and then chapter 4, verse uh, later on in this chapter, he's talking about suffering with the hope of glory in Christ. So rejoice in your present suffering because your rejoicing in the glory will be much, much greater uh, at that time of being glorified. Uh, then we go into chapter 5. Um, he talks about in view of Christ's return, how should we as a church conduct ourselves? So he talks about how elders and young believers should relate to each other, young believers submitting to elders. Um, and then uh, he calls the church to stand firm in the midst of suffering. And then he closes the letter, um, signing off with Silas and Mark and greetings from the church in Babylon. Um, so that's the end of First Peter. Any questions or thoughts on that before we move into Second Peter? Okay, uh, let's uh, go into Second Peter. Uh, so here in Second Peter chapter. Uh, 3 verses 1 to 2, we see uh, who the author, recipients, and purpose of writing is. So if someone can read that for us, Second Peter 3 verses 1 and 2. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Okay, so uh, from this, we gather that the author is Peter himself. Again, it's disputed uh, by some circles whether this was written by Peter, but as per um, this passage and as per the nearness of writing to Peter's life itself, uh, we, uh, we accept this as an, a letter written by Peter. Um, the recipients, again, we see that it's the same group of churches because he says, this is now my second letter to you. Um, and I've written both of them. And then he gives what the purpose of writing is, right? Reminder to stimulate you to wholesome thinking, to recall the words spoken by the holy prophets and the commands given by our Lord and Savior. So Second Peter is actually quite different from First Peter in its theme. While First Peter is uh, being written to suffering Christians, Second Peter is being written to the church to guard against false teaching. Okay, so there was uh, wrong teaching that was coming into the church. And so that's why he's saying to stimulate you to wholesome thinking, that is to write understanding of the message of scripture, 
uh, going back to the prophets and the teachings of Jesus. So this is where I want you as a church to be grounded so that false teaching will not lead you astray. Uh, the date of writing we see as closer to his death. So uh, he refers to this in 2 Peter 1.14. Uh, if we can just read that as well. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 14. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Knowing that shortly I, mu I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Okay, and so in verse 13 he says, I think it's right to refresh your memory because this... Uh, because I'm going to be uh, leaving this body soon, okay? Uh, so the central theme is warning against false teachers. Um, to look at it from a positive side, he's actually encouraging them to know, to stand firm in what they know about God. Uh, so you see the word knowing mentioned nine times in this whole letter. Uh, it's not in your textbook. But uh, knowledge of God, knowledge of the way of righteousness, and knowledge itself mentioned nine times in three chapters. So he's saying, stay firm in your knowledge of God. Stay firm in your knowledge of the way of right righteousness. Uh, and grow in knowledge so that you will not fall for wrong teaching. Uh, some of the unique features, so uh, there is a kind of severity to the letter because he's dealing with false teaching. So the severity is towards the false teachers, not, to, not towards the church. Uh, he talks about the inspiration of scripture. So this is where uh, we see prophets' word inspired by the Holy Spirit in their writing uh, comes in chapter 1. Uh, he talks about false teachers and the way false teachers operate. And we see actually that this is very close to what Jude talks about. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, um, in a few slides. And then he talks about the day of the Lord. So Second Peter actually has a, a description of the earth uh, burning away, of all the elements in the earth burning away on the day of the Lord. So judgment on this world. And uh, just focusing on the fact that Christ's judgment is coming uh, against these false teachers. Uh, and then the last part is where he affirms Paul's teaching. So chapter 3, he talks about the fact that uh, Paul has written certain things that are being twisted by the false teachers. And he elevates Paul's teaching to the level of the rest of scripture in this verse, basically saying just as these false teachers twist the rest of scripture, they also twist Paul's teaching. Uh, compared to other books, uh, just like John 14 to 16 and 2 Timothy, our farewell letters or farewell discourses, uh, John 14 to 16 from Jesus, 2 Timothy from Paul, uh, 2 Peter is a farewell discourse as well. Uh, 2 Thessalonians and 2 Peter focus on the judgment that comes with the day of the Lord. And then uh, between Jude and 2 Peter, there's actually uh, some of the same things we read in Jude are also in Second Peter. So uh, this is just a quote from Michael Green. Of 25 verses in Jude, no less than 15 appear in whole or in part in Second Peter. So that is the, it, they actually write almost the same content. So it's believed that... Um, that Peter used Jude as a source when he was writing. So he's used a little bit of Jude's content in the things that he writes in the cha in chapter 2. Um, OK, so with that, we'll just go into our outline of Second Peter. Um, he begins with God's provision for Christian living. Uh, we'll just read chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Someone can read that for us.
chapter 1 verse 2 to 3 grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of god and of jesus our lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue okay so uh here he is saying that god or jesus has given us everything we need to lead a godly life uh through our knowledge of him it's by knowing him that we are able to live a life of godliness um and he then goes on to talk about how they can be confident in who jesus is pointing to the father's affirmation of jesus as his son in his baptism so he says that we were witnesses we heard the voice of the father affirming that jesus is his son and then he also talks about how prophecies uh from the old testament affirm jesus's majesty so uh taking them back like we read in chapter 3 verse 1 to taking them back to uh the prophecies and the teachings uh of jesus as their uh source of confidence or rootedness in the truth uh he then goes on to talk about false teachers so uh some of the ways uh that you can identify false teachers is that they deny jesus and the second is that their teaching leads to sinful lifestyles so uh, the people who follow their teaching start to turn away from holiness and start to live lives of sin uh so that is evidence that their teaching is false uh he then talks about their doom and uh contrast that with our salvation so for those who uh do not fall for their teaching there is a hope of salvation uh and for these false teachers themselves there is a day of judgment that will come and he talks about the angels who were judged he talks about the people at the time of noah who were judged and he talks about sodom and gomora uh, all as examples of places that were judged uh because of their um immoral lifestyles and because of not following the truth uh and then he goes on to a description of the false teachers and this is where the we see the same content that's in Jude also in second peter uh so second peter closes with christ certain return this is in chapter 3 um so the false teachers deny christ return if we can read chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 we just uh read from there someone beloved i know i now write to you this second epistle in both of which i stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the lord and savior okay thank you sorry we read that before as well uh, but this is uh, so uh, this is where he talks about why he is writing and then he goes on to talk about the fact that the false teachers deny christ's return uh, he then talks about the new heaven and the new earth uh and the day of the lord that is the judgment that is going to come on this present earth um and then the last part is in view of the fact that this new heaven and new earth is coming that all that we see right now all sin uh all that we see in present creation is going to be destroyed how should we be living our lives uh so we'll just read these three verses to conclude uh chapter 3 verses 14 and 17 and 18 if someone can read that therefore beloved looking forward to these things be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless 17 and 18 you therefore beloved since you know this beforehand be aware lest you fall from your own steadfastness being led by being led away with the error of the wicked but grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be the glory both now and forever amen okay so um these are the key things that he talks about in this whole letter one is in view of 
judgment that is to come. Uh, walk in holiness. So be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Christ. Okay. Uh, don't uh, don't fall into a lifestyle of sin. Don't turn away from Christ. And then 17 and 18, he says, be on your guard so you won't be carried away by the uh, by the wrong teaching that's coming in and grow in grace and knowledge okay so be on your guard and grow in grace and knowledge if we look back to the beginning of the letter we see right there also that he says it's the knowledge of jesus that is able to any uh, that is able to keep us uh, in godliness enables us to walk in godliness and so here he closes again with that same thought of growing in knowledge of Jesus himself. Uh, so uh, that is the key to not falling into wrong teaching and not falling into sin. OK, so we close with that. Uh, any questions, any thoughts, anything you want to share before we close? All good? OK. So just a reminder, uh, on Thursday, we're going to do 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And I've asked you all to read all three letters. We'll just do a discussion in class. OK, so um, I won't really cover the textbook's content. Um, we'll just discuss some of the things that you all have learned after reading. And then next Monday, we'll do Revelation. Okay. Okay. Thank you.